This week, we begin a three-episode series on Yellowstone National Park and our travels. We spent about three weeks in Yellowstone, and we're excited to share our travels there with you. Plus, we have an answer to a question about when to winterize and a whole lot more. This is RV Miles. The RV Miles podcast is sponsored by L.L. Bean, your source for warm, cozy styles this fall. For 108 years, L.L. Bean has staked their reputation on making comfortable clothing and gear to help you enjoy the healthy benefits of being outside. From legendary main made boots to layers that are just the right weight to flannel shirts that out cozy all others. Find joy in the tried and true. Visit LLBean.com to find your store or shop now. L.L. Bean. Be an outsider. Welcome to episode 163 of RV Miles. I'm Jason. And I'm Abby. And we are two full-time travelers who, along with our boys, Jack, Ethan, and Henry, are crisscrossing North America on one epic road trip. Each week, we talk all things RV and outdoors, from travel destinations to gear, industry news, our national parks, and a whole lot more. We are very, very excited to be coming to you from Custer State Park in the great state of South Dakota this we week. Made it. Uh, we love Custer so much. This is our we just arrived. Uh, ap- apologies for the the <laughs> delayed podcast and the the sort of <laughs> <laughs> un, unreasonable un, un uh what's the what's the word the un- unrealistic <laughs> the, the schedule that we set upon ourselves. The disorganized uh release dates <laughs> of our podcasts. Uh, all three of them over the last couple of weeks. It's been a little bit of a mess. <laughs> we were hoping to to be able to get to Custer and film outside. That's one of the reasons why we delayed getting this out because we wanted to have the beautiful Custer background. But instead, you're getting the beautiful trailer background if you are watching on YouTube, including our wonderful little family picture with Bussy right there. So that was just, you know, kind of how our day went. We didn't get here nearly as early as we wanted to, and that's just kind of how the last couple weeks have been as we continue to make our way to colder destinations, because why would we want to be warm? <laughs> well, <laughs> fall fall is definitely here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've got my I got my flannel on. Finally get to wear my my good LL Bean flannel. Speaking of cozy flannels, <laughs> you wasted no time. I actually have my cozy slippers on because it's cold. We uh spent a great week at the Rocky Point Recreation Area, another South Dakota state park before coming here, which was just sort of re- actually I never left that campground. No, you, you I did. did. You went to the, you went, I went to, to the bakery you went and to the, the bakery shop. got coffee. I that was the first time in a long time. I never left that campground the entire week we were there. No, I left just a couple times. One to do laundry because it had been twelve days. So you can only imagine five people, twelve days worth of laundry that had to be done. And then I enjoyed one morning going with my friend, the family we've been traveling with. She and I took some us time and we went and got a coffee. And just got to chat uninterrupted, (laughs) which was amazing. We learned so much about each other that we hadn't known. And we've been together for five months. So it was it was really nice. But that's a beautiful campground. Mm -hmm. And we absolutely have to recommend Site 41. Oh, my goodness. Right on the the beach, right on the lake. And, you know, beaches at reservoirs are not like sandy beaches. They're always No, it's sort of, called Rocky Point yeah, Reservoir. Yeah, for a reason. You know, it's, there's... it's like rocks and then mud. Yes. But, uh, but beautiful sunset views. South Dakota, in general, has really great state parks. They really do. And while we did not stay in Site 41, our friends were in it. And, it and we was... were there yeah, all, every every moment we had. Yeah, they probably <laughs> thought we were like moving in because it was such a great site. So Site 41, if you ever find yourself at Rocky Point Reservoir in uh, Belfourche, Belfourche, South Dakota. Belfourche. Let's not get all fancy here. Well, okay. my family is French. <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> uh, so as the weather is beginning to turn colder and people are 
camping and people are camping later in the season than ever. I mean, because the camping season was so shortened because of the pandemic uh, and so many campgrounds closed early on and because so many people have bought RVs now. Yeah, that's the real reason. They have an <laughs> RV and they want to get their money's worth. People are camping late into this season this year, and that's fantastic. Not that I would consider it late yet, but um, this is about the time every year that we start seeing the question pop up constantly. At what point do I need to winterize? And a new member of our Facebook group, Nathan, was the first one to bring that very question up this year. He says, I'm wondering what we need to do to prep our RV for just one or two nights of freezing temperatures, going to get to about 30 degrees where we are in Colorado for just a night or two. It seems like most stuff I find online discusses winterizing for long-term use. Do we need to worry about the whole winterizing process for just a night or two? We have been able to go, I think, as far as the high teens, low yeah. The low, the overnight low. So if it's only getting there for a couple hours max at night, while you're using the RV, you have your furnace running and you don't have your water hose connected to a water spigot. That's the first thing that's going to freeze, mm -hmm. hands down. And and it will cause damage. I mean, you think, oh, I'll just let my hose freeze and it'll thaw. But we've had hoses start to leak because of that happening and because we've you know let them freeze so uh, make sure to not be hooked up fill your water tank even if you are at a campground where you have full hookups at that point when it's going to get down into freezing temperatures at night we will fill our water tank and unhook our hose and usually be fine you know we start to worry uh when it gets down into the 20s for more than a few hours at a time yeah yeah we didn't do this upper teens, low 20s by choice. This was during our stint in North Dakota. And I do know at some point we made the decision because really another key factor is how warm is it going to get during the day? If it's going to climb above freezing and it's going to stay above freezing for most of the day and into the evening, then like you said, a few hours where it's really, really frigid, you should be okay as long as you're unhooked. Now, we do not have a special winter package rv no. uh, ours is very basic we do have an enclosed underbelly but it's like you know thin plastic um, so you know if your rv is is set up for going deeper into colder temperatures you can probably go further i know nathan mentioned that they have tank heaters i'm a little iffy on tank heaters because yeah they keep your tanks from freezing that's a good thing which is a great thing but i think your tanks are not likely to be the first thing to freeze. More likely it's going to be the plumbing yeah. going into the tanks and, and so forth. So, yeah. uh, but you should be fine. Uh, and, and winterizing is super easy. It does not take long. What you have to worry about is travel days when you won't have your heat running. That's when you should be concerned about should I winterize or, or not if it is getting below freezing while you're traveling during the day. Then I, then I would be concerned. But it's if you're in a cold climate and you're going to drive a few hours to a little bit warmer weather, you want to dewinterize when you get there and winterize on your way back. It's not that hard. No, uh, it's really you know, not. It, and you can even do, we're not, a, we do like to use the, the pink liquid instead of just blowing out the airlines, which is, it's very difficult to get every bit of water. And it, you know, some of the issues that people have when they, they don't use the pink liquid and they just blow out the water with the air is is water left behind in the pump for instance which can freeze and cause damage to your pump but if you're just doing it for like that day or two and then you're coming back use your air compressor get the little attachment they have that you can hook up to your water system and blow the blow the air out of the lines be good to go yeah i think that if we were able to make it through north dakota into you know i think it was maybe november sixth so i'm not quite sure somewhere around your birthday that we ended up leaving if we can make it through in just a very basic entry level rv anyone should really be okay as long as they're just paying attention to the temperature and paying attention to what's going on inside their rig and another thing i'd really advocate though too what comes with cold weather and what comes with running your furnace all of the time is condensation inside of your rig so be really really mindful of that when we're running our heater Anywhere around 72, 
we start to build up condensation in here. So my family doesn't like it, but I don't keep it as warm as they would like because I don't want to deal with that underneath the dinette, underneath the sofa. Places you don't get to can build that up and that can cause a real issue for you later on down the line. It's really about the difference in temperature mm -hmm. between the inside and the outside. That's what creates condensation. Yeah. And a lot of people use dehumidifiers it, honestly, I would rather you low the, lower the temperature than using a dehumidifier because it's unhealthy to, to have. I mean, it's okay to use a dehumidifier. Don't get me wrong, especially right. if you're in a humid area. But if you're sitting at like, you know, 25% humidity already, you're going to drop that lower. You're getting into real unhealthy territory there. You know, you really should be having moisture enter your lungs. That's a good thing for your body. So I, it's I would, just yeah. not a good thing for your yeah. RV. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. So I want to ask you as our question of the week, how late into the camping season, if you are in a colder climate, do you go camping and uh, do you winterize, dewinterize, or do you just winterize it and put it away for, for the winter and are a warm weather camper only answer in the comments on YouTube. If you're watching the YouTube version of this podcast, and if you're not, you can just go there and ask the question anyway. If you had really been thinking about it, you should have said, our question of the week is, how low can you go? So You're uh, welcome. You're welcome, America. I'm glad we don't have an audience here so that you couldn't hear the groan. That's uh, exactly <laughs> the whole point. You need the groan. You need it's it's like I'm sitting here in a football stadium right now playing a game and I got nobody who's responding to me. We want to remind everybody that we have two other podcasts. We have the See America podcast every week and the America's National Parks podcast every week. See America this week was about the Library of Congress, which is just a spectacular campus. It's three ginormous buildings and uh, if you ever visit Washington, D.C., I think this is one of the things I talked about on, on the episode is I think everybody that visits Washington, D.C. does not put enough time in their schedule. And and we certainly did that oh, on our know. first visit. Yeah. And there is just so much great to do there. So check that out uh, and hear about the Library of Congress. And you can check out the America's National Parks podcast, which this week was all the different news from the parks, including some international park news. Yeah, and two new parks joined the National Park Service. Two new units, number 420 and 421. That's right. All right, it's time for our Ask of the Week, which is a new thing that we're doing, a way to help you find ways to help us. Help <laughs> lots me of people help you. <laughs> lots of people are always asking us, what can they do to help us out? Do we have a Patreon? Can they send us? Uh, you know, can they sign up for a Patreon? Don't send like us we, money in the mail. We, Don't do it. <laughs> we really appreciate all the support we, we get. And yes. we we have come up with this rotating series of we're just going to ask you to do if simple things that are free um, that if you want to. You know, if you yeah. want, if you're thinking about it, if you want to do something to help us out, please do. And what we're asking this week is that you go sign up for our brand new email list. Yeah, we've done four and they've come out on the exact same day it's every amazing. week. <laughs> I'm very proud of myself. I'm kind of uh, spearheading this one. And so uh, usually Jason reminds me Monday night that we have a newsletter that needs to go out on and Tuesday. You're and like, you're like putting your pajamas on. and mm -hmm. yeah. Getting ready to watch my Sanditon. And then you're <laughs> like, hey, by the way. Uh, so you should go... <laughs> So if you would like to see what we're putting out every week, it's RV news, it's camping news, it's about the RV lifestyle, it's a little bit about what we're up to, maybe a little bit closer inside look at where we've been, what we've been doing. There's trivia, of course, because it's RV miles. There's a deal of the week. There's just a ton of stuff in there and it's constantly rotating. So if you want to come over, sign up for our mailing list and join our weekly free newsletter, just go to rvmiles.com slash mailing list. Mailing list is all one word, rvmiles.com slash mailing list. We will also put it in the show notes for this episode at rvmiles.com slash 163. Thank you so much in advance for everything you do to support RV Miles. It means the absolute world to Jason and I. Fall is here, so it's time to start thinking about prepping for the winter off season. 
Whether you own an RV, a travel trailer, or a camper, EmpireCovers.com is here to help protect all your vehicles against Mother Nature. EmpireCovers.com offers high-quality, affordable covers that are engineered to protect. Every cover comes with a free multi-year warranty to guarantee that it remains durable over time. RV Miles listeners can receive free shipping plus an extra 15% off their entire order. Visit EmpireCovers.com slash RV Miles or use the promo code RV Miles, all one word, at checkout. EmpireCovers.com. Protect what you love. Are you already dreaming of that epic 2021 road trip? Or maybe you want to take a weekend road trip and explore your state. Now is the perfect time to become a Road Trippers Plus subscriber and put those plans into action. A Road Trippers Plus subscription allows you to add up to 150 stops to your road trip ad free. You can look for campgrounds, local eats, outdoor recreation, and more. A Road Trippers Plus subscription is normally $29.99. However, RV Miles listeners can save 20% off with coupon code RVMILES2X, all one word. That's 20% off of Road Trippers Plus with code RVMILES2X. We'll put a link to the discount in the show notes at rvmiles.com slash 163. It's time for the answer to last week's brain teaser, which went like this. Two trains on the same track are speeding towards one another. The trains are 150 miles apart. When they are at 150 miles apart, a very fast B flies from the bumper of one train, the front bumper that is, to the front bumper bumper of the oncoming train. And of course, as soon as it gets there without losing any time, it turns right around and heads back. So as these trains are speeding toward each other and the bee flies at 137 and a half miles per hour, how far will the bee have traveled before he is squashed like a grape? Oh, and by the way, the trains are traveling at 75 miles per hour. Did Don't you, just... you love these train math questions? It's a word problem from high school. Oh, I just love it so much. Just as much as I love winter. Um, I didn't do the math on this, so I'm just going to sit back over here and let you explain it. Most of the information in this brain teaser was absolutely useless. But knowing the no, trains shocking. are 150 <laughs> miles apart and they're traveling at 75 miles an hour, in one hour they would have crashed, right? So if the bee is traveling at 137.5 miles an hour, the bee will have traveled 137.5 miles before the trains crash. Today, we want to talk about Yellowstone. This is going to be the first of three episodes that we're going to talk about our trip to Yellowstone because we spent so much time there, which was just fantastic. And uh, it is such a huge park. There is a heck of a lot to know about, and we didn't want to try to cram it all into one episode. So we're going to yeah. give you it in short pieces here so that you can digest it, right? Well, because <laughs> the world is also happening around us as we talk about Yellowstone. There's always things to talk about in the RV industry and in the camping world. And, you know, I know in the past we used to do these travel recaps that would be like two segments. And then the podcast episode would be like an hour and 15 minutes long. Ain't nobody got time for that. Even in the middle of a pandemic, ain't nobody got time for an hour and 15 minutes I on do. Yellowstone. I, I know you do, but <laughs> so, Abby doesn't have time. So on this episode, we're going to do kind of an overview of the park, and then we're going to talk about West Yellowstone, which is where we stayed uh, for the majority uh, of our time yeah. at the park. So first of all, Yellowstone is a massive park. It is so big. Yeah, and <laughs> don't think you're going to stay near one entrance and really actually see all of the park. Just to give you you're an not. idea, so the, the, the Grand Loop Road, which is sort of the main way you access anything in Yellowstone, it's a giant figure eight that goes through the park. Just to do the bottom part portion, the bottom circle of the, the figure southern eight, loop. took us two and a half hours of driving time only without stops yes. just to drive that. So you want to spend one day doing that and you stop at several overlooks and the little short trails to different geothermal uh, features. You're going to be spending 
you know, a, a very, very busy all day and yeah. still not be able to get to do anywhere near everything. And for people like me who have a really hard time driving past any sort of historical marker or any sort of stop, if it says overlook, if it says a historical marker a thousand feet, if it says uh, XYZ geyser right ahead and it's literally just to pull off and you walk like two feet and you look at it and you get back in the car, I'm going to do it. I want to do it. And that was not possible in Yellowstone. So someone like me who wants to do all of the things really, really struggled for the first like few days because I couldn't. It just, it wasn't possible. And it's, it can be very, very overwhelming and staying where we stayed for our first week there, right at the west entrance to the park, still 20 minutes to get to the Grand Loop Road yeah. before heading anywhere on it. So lots and lots to do, lots of people, lots of cars, lots of wildlife. Wildlife can slow any travels down within the park because, you know, you get those bison jams and the two lane road gets backed up. Even if the bison aren't on the road, people are stopping uh. to look at them. So there, there's lots that can slow you down. So it's a park that you have to really take your time and make a plan for. If you are traveling in a motor home that is of decent size, so not like a class B or a real small class, class C, a. a lot of people rent cars if you don't take a car with you, additional towed vehicle. A lot of people rent cars when they get to Yellowstone because it is difficult to travel around Yellowstone, visit sites in a large motorhome. They do have motorhome parking at a lot of the uh, trailhead overlook type places, uh, but sometimes you're not going to be able to fit in those parking lots. You're going to have to park down the road and walk back well, or you won't get in at all. Listen, Honestly, the real issue with those parking spots is there will be people out there in their little tiny fiats. Yeah, filling up them all. That take them. Yeah. And that was something that, you know, was really frustrating. And actually, a few of you commented on some of our Yellowstone pictures about that, like the frustration of pulling into the parking lot and having these what are clearly marked as designated RV spots. And then seeing cars parked in them because the cars have come in and the parking lot area for the cars is completely filled. So they say, okay, I'm just going to go ahead and take this spot. Well, now you've compromised someone in their big class A who's coming in to take one of those RV spots because they can't get into it anymore. Now, I'm not saying that you can't tour Yellowstone in a large motor home. Uh, lots of people do. Lots of people Absolutely. were doing it when we were there. Uh, definitely lots of rental RVs do. It, it's just... Something to think about and be careful about, but especially this year, we didn't experience this, uh, but in most years, there are also lots of tour buses mm -hmm. in addition to large RVs. So it's just, you, you, it, you're you going to uh, be limited a little bit on the stuff that you'll want to try to do because you want to have an experience where you can park your motor home and then, um, you know, go explore an area for a while without having to hop from stop to stop in something massive. Now, the the nice thing about having a motorhome, the flip side to this in Yellowstone is the fact that you can, you know, just hop in and get your meals yeah. and go to the restroom and all that sort of stuff and move to the next site, which we saw a lot of people doing in their little class Bs and got us really thinking, yeah, hmm, in the future, yeah. hmm. Yellowstone <laughs> was made... For class B driving. Yeah. For sure. So what a lot of people do when they camp at Yellowstone, and this is probably the best way to do Yellowstone, is utilize Yellowstone's campgrounds and not stay at the same one the whole time. Move between them. You stay in an area and then visit that area and move to another campground and visit that area. That's a little bit challenging because mm -hmm. there's only one campground in Yellowstone with hookups, Fishing Bridge, and it has been closed for the past two seasons, and it will be closed all next season as well. If you didn't know that, uh, they announced uh, late last month, I believe, that Fishing Bridge will be closed for yet another entire camping season. I believe it's, they were talking about opening September 2021. That's their plan is September. Yeah. The thing with Fishing Bridge, too, is that it's not cheap. To stay at Fishing Bridge. No, it's like for us, I think I 
I think 85? they do charge per person beyond twos. So I think it was 85. Yeah. Something like that will be what it would cost if we wanted to stay in Fishing Bridge. You weigh that up against, though, the amount of fuel you're going to spend coming in and out of the park every single day. And it's absolutely worth it. I can understand why it's so popular and why everyone wants to do it. We certainly, being right there at the West Yellowstone entrance, we put an insane amount of miles on that truck while we were there. So much so that we needed to get an oil change afterwards because we were over. We spent a decent amount on fuel. Now, we did that because we knew that once we moved out of West Yellowstone and went over to the state park that we were going to be going to, which was going to be an additional 20 to 25 minutes just to get to the park entrance, we knew that we wouldn't want to be coming in as much. So we just basically said every single day that we are at this private campground up against the park, we're going in. Now, another thing that you really need to know on the whole about Yellowstone is that there is very little cell service in the park. There are a few areas where there is some cell service, mm -hmm. like, but you may get a good signal um, like at the Old Faithful area. Old we Faithful, got... Canyon Lodge, and Mammoth Lodge area. Yeah. Those all have cell service. Now you have to realize though, you might think, oh, that's fantastic. And you know what? I got there and I had, I think, three bars LTE of Verizon. But you know what? So did all the other hundreds of people that were there. Yeah. So we were all sharing this one tower. And while I might have had fantastic service, or at least my phone was telling me I did, the tower was busy. So don't go and think that you're going to be able to check all the things and, you know, get online and, and do what you want to do there just because they say they have service. If there's a lot of people there, they're thinking the exact same thing as you. Yeah. Uh, finally, uh, about the park as a whole, I want to say that it is a very accessible park. Mm -hmm. Virtually every place that you can visit. And, it, you know, there it's known for the the geothermal features, the geysers, the steam vents, and the, the basins, the, uh, the hot yeah. springs. There are thousands and thousands of them. It's there's not, ten thousand of them it, in the park. Yeah, it's not like Old Faithful and then Mammoth. No, and like, no. It, they're everywhere. They're almost all surrounded by boardwalks uh, that you could you could take a walker on, you mm -hmm. could take a wheelchair on. You're not really hiking. You're just really sort of walking around. There, there. It's not a huge hiking park. There are hikes. There's certainly lots of hikes you can do. I don't want to, you know, say that there isn't, but. I was going to say, do we actually know that well, for sure though? Because it was very, very difficult to get any sort of information on a hike from the from the right. park map yeah. and the information that they give you when you come in. We couldn't find anything. Also, they have an app, Yellowstone does, and I absolutely recommend that you download that app before you go into the park because it does have a GPS on it that can help you navigate when you don't have service. But even that app didn't have hikes. The, the thing about Yellowstone, when I say it's not really a hiking park, there, there are some... There are lots of hiking mm -hmm. that happens within Yellowstone. Lots of people go there to hike. But what I mean by that is that the loop road takes you to almost everything. And uh, there's so much to do that if it's, you know, if you're not really going there to hike, you know, it's just not even something we hardly thought we would ever even have the time for. Normally we think, how many of these different hikes are we going to do? We did one fairly decent size hike but yeah but for the most part it, it's you're driving to there's so much driving there's so much road and you're driving to all these different destinations and visiting the other thing i want to say one more thing is that there are there are lots of services within yellowstone so even though it is so big there are there are gas stations in the park uh, at the areas where the hotels are, there are little stores that have groceries and stuff. Uh, lots of restrooms. Restaurants. Uh, there's lots an restaurants. auto repair shop over Yeah, you, you can actually get your vehicle fixed in Yellowstone. Yeah, they were busy. <laughs> they, they were. You know, I want to say something. I just want to jump back for a minute before we move on from this overview and start talking about West Yellowstone. I think the fact that this is... Um, not a, as you say, hiking park is actually a double-edged sword because oh, yeah. 
halfway through our time there, I was really craving a hike that was going to get me away from the main road. You know, we talk a lot about the fact that most people never, ever get off of the main road of a national park more than like a quarter mile. And so for us, that's really important to us that we get past that quarter mile, that we get into the park, that we get to see beyond what they have designated we should see in our automobiles. And it was really, really hard for us to do that because it's such a visual park. I mean, there's just so much to see and do. But I really, really was craving a way to, to connect with the park that didn't need me to pull off into a parking lot and then walk on a boardwalk or, you know, walk with, with everybody else. But even, Does that, I don't yeah, know if that makes sense. 100%. But even those boardwalky type areas, a lot of people just go to the thing, the main thing that it's known for, the thing in front. And yeah. then often there's a lot more to that area, even like Old Faithful. Mm-hmm. You, they go to Old Faithful and they look at Old Faithful and they move on, forgetting that it is... There's a beautiful it, 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 walk behind it. The upper guy, it's the whole upper it's geyser basin. And it's some of the most famous geysers other than Old Faithful mm-hmm. are right there. And hardly anybody was walking the, the yeah. upper geyser basin boardwalk. And that's, I mean, to me, that was better than Old Faithful. Yeah. If getting out onto a big hiking trailer into, you know, what starts to feel like some of the back country of a national park isn't an option then it becomes like it did for us. Okay, this is the main attraction. But if I go left and everybody else is going right, but if we go left, what happens when we go left? And we did that a few times, especially when we were doing the Southern Loop Drive. You know, so there are ways to kind of pull out from the pack a little bit and enjoy Yellowstone and, and have it be an experience that doesn't feel like you're in an amusement park. But this is probably the amusement park park of now, the national park service <laughs> now a lot of people have been asking us how are the crowds and um let me say first of all that august awesome. august was uh 10 percent more visitation this august than last august at yellowstone i don't understand that jason but when we were there at the very end of august into september mm-hmm. Great. There is nobody. It was great. There were a few days where it got really busy, especially Labor Day weekend. And the and the week following. Um, but it wasn't terrible by any means. No. I can see how I would really dislike a visit to Yellowstone when it's very, very busy. Yes. Because those parking lots are not that big. And many of them, even without the park being very full were the the parking lots themselves were, were were getting pretty full for yeah. us so i the difficulty of wanting to go to a place not being able to park that would annoy the heck out of me oh absolutely we just really caught lightning in a bottle yeah. while we were there yeah. we and were lucky there were times when we felt like we had the whole park to ourselves and we would just be you know having a picnic somewhere and that's all stuff we're going to cover in a future episode but you know, if you're thinking there's no way I can go to Yellowstone and I'm not going to be with like 500,000 of my closest friends, well, we're here to tell you. I don't know if it's just because, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic, but, you know, they're crushing numbers in the National Park Service right now when it comes to visitation. And we just went to Yellowstone National Park and we never sat in traffic. We never waited to get into the park. We never had an issue finding parking. I, it, it blows my mind. I think there was a lot of indifference um, from people be, about the fire and smoke For as, sure. as well. And it was a great park, actually. We were a little concerned about smoke, but it was a great park to visit during a smoky period because everything is sort of low and in, in front of you there. and available as opposed to like Grand Tetons right nearby where if you can't see the Tetons, you might be a little disappointed. It is disappointing when you can't see the Tetons. Okay, <laughs> so we uh, spent our uh, first week at Yellowstone in the town of West Yellowstone. And mm-hmm. our second two weeks were beyond the town of West Yellowstone, but we were coming from that entrance. So the town of West Yellowstone is sort of the main gateway community for the park. 
and it is on the it is on the west side obviously of the park and it is physically in montana but only barely because you just drive out of it for a bit and you're out of you're in idaho or you drive into the park and you're in wyoming but it's technically in montana but it is west of the park not north of the park uh, the, Everybody got that. <laughs> the the other gateway community is Gardner, Montana, and that's at the north entrance of the park. Those are sort of the two main bigger gateway communities where you can find grocery stores and RV parks and all that. Well, we call them grocery stores. Yeah. Oh, Ooh. Get your groceries in advance, folks. Yes. Holy Ooh. cow, groceries Oof. are expensive in, in West Yellowstone. Yeah. So we stayed at Buffalo Crossing RV Park, which is literally butted up right to Yellowstone National Park. I cannot say exactly how much we spent per night because I have completely blocked that from my memory. <laughs> it was but it was it was about 60 bucks a night. I think it was closer to 70. It was about 70 bucks a night. Yes, uh but it was absolutely worth it if you're looking at this as we were treating it like a legit vacation. Like we were going on vacation because we were so close to the park, we were saving time getting into the park. Because we were right there in the gateway town, we were able to walk right out of our campsite and be right into West Yellowstone to enjoy the shopping and the food and the coffee and the coffee. And it was... <laughs> it's, it's super <laughs> no frills. It's full hookups, no, but no super no frills uh, campground. Very small sites, but very clean. Uh, mm -hmm. And But the, really the... The benefit here is not only being close to that entrance, but what we really loved was just being able to walk out yeah. of the campground and just be in downtown West Yellowstone and explore the shops and the restaurants and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. It's also in it, it's in the same complex as the big IMAX theater. Yeah. And, and so the IMAX theater is actually in the parking lot of, of this uh, campground. And there's a really good gift shop in, the, in there probably as well. my yeah. favorite gift shop there in west yellowstone and it's called the uh yellowstone it's the ynp right yellowstone trading post ytp y yes yes the it yellowstone trading post and they have a deal with this campground that you get 25 percent off anything that you purchase they also give you a discount on the imax movies yes and this gift shop has 50 cent cones of huckleberry mm -hmm. ice cream yeah and you don't have to be staying at the RV park to take advantage of that. So if you find yourself in West Yellowstone, go over to YTP, go inside and get 50 cent Huckleberry cones. It's absolutely worth it. Plus they had some really, really great stuff in there. It's not kitschy. It's not like, you know, you walk out and you buy that t-shirt and then like you go to put it on a month later and you think, oh, I was so swept up in being in this place. But, oh man, why did I buy that shirt? It, there's, it's not that. We get some really, really great looking stuff. I think that's going to stick with us for a really long time from there. Um, and it's just nice that your campsite in your campground is right there. Buffalo Crossing has laundry on premise. It's not horribly expensive. It's expensive, but it's not horrible. I've certainly seen worse. Very clean. And it's nice, again, to be able to just be there at your campsite and do your laundry. All the campgrounds in Yellowstone as well as in West Yellowstone, and I'm assuming up in Gardner uh, and other areas as well, you will have to put anything away that can attract bears. So your your grill has to go be put away every single night. You can't leave a cooler out, even if you don't have anything in it. They're attracted to coolers because they've learned that there's food in them. So that's just something to think about. Yeah, um, so we played it safe and we didn't do any cooking with our Blackstone actually at the campsite. We did a ton of cooking in the park and we'll talk about that on a future episode. But we just thought, you know, better safe than sorry. And we just didn't get anything out. All right. What did we do in West Yellowstone? Where are some, we of, the, just, where are some of the good little places that we found? Well, we didn't do a ton per se, but we did eat plenty there, we're, while we were there it, it, we are in a pandemic and uh the town was doing a, a great job mm -hmm. of, of managing that from our perspective but most stuff was open and available with limitations absolutely and so we did enjoy you know walking around outside downtown we did enjoy popping into a few of the shops there are so many shops there's i there's a christmas in montana shop which was lovely we went in there i mean my heart was just singing cuz i 
love that time of year. There are several candy shops. You know, the kids absolutely loved that. The whole town is brimming with everything Huckleberry. Huckleberry food, Huckleberry clothes, Huckleberry tea, Huckleberry (laughs) soaps. I mean, you name it. If they can turn Huckleberry into something, they're going to do it and you can buy it there. We also enjoyed a lot of food, took advantage of the fact that we were so close to a town and that we could get takeout the way we did. And I think if we're going to talk about food, we have to start with barbecue. Look, we have Holy sp- moly. <laughs> we have spent a lot of time in some places well known for their barbecue. And I, you know, I think there is a little bit of like I don't know why people get so caught up on oh if you're in this certain area that's where the barbecue is. Well, people, you know, people move around the country. I like have a, a good chef from Kansas City who makes Kansas City barbecue moves to him. another town. That doesn't mean it's not good barbecue anymore because he's not in Kansas City. The point being, <laughs> the point being, Firehole Barbecue in West Yellowstone. Wow, some of the best barbecue we have ever yeah. ever had. Yeah. Really good barbecue. I went in there the first day we and we went back several times. But the first day I went in there, we got uh, brisket sandwiches, and he, the guy at the counter goes to the the like a, a, a steam box behind him. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a, like a fridge, but it's heated, right? Not, right. Not cooled. He opens it up and pulls out an entire brisket that was black. So good. From being smoked for like 14 hours. So good. And he's like, do you want the wet end or the dry end? Like, the I think he end. said, do you want the lean side or the fat side? Because <laughs> so, I said, it was the, the wet, fat he, he side. Said, the, west, <laughs> the wet side or the lean side. And I'm like, come on. <laughs> so and he's, he just slices it. And it, was, he, it had not been sliced off at all. And he slices a, just a heap of brisket mm-hmm. for our brisket sandwiches uh, off of this thing. The most tender brisket I've ever had. Look, we gotta. We're gonna need to roll this along because we're gonna probably spend twenty minutes talking about this BBQ place. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was really good. We went back several it times. Really it's fantastic. Ribs fell off the bone. All the sides <sighs> were great. Please go if you're there. They do this thing though that they open and once it's gone, it's gone. You'll find and a lot of barbecue go. places across yeah. the country do that. They, you know, they make what they make overnight. Yeah, and. Uh, when they open in the morning at 10 or whatever, when it's, it's gone, gone, it's gone. It's uh, gone. <laughs> we came in really, really late one night from the park. I think it was like 10, 10 30 by the time we got home. And the whole air just smelled like barbecue because it was, there's two barbecue places in West Yellowstone. And it was clear that they do their cooking around 10 o'clock through the night. And the air there just smelled like barbecue. It was divine. So one of the things that I enjoyed doing was getting up in the morning and walking to a different bakery. And there are enough in West Yellowstone that you could go to a different one probably every day of the week and try out something. Just to give you a rundown of a few places we went to, we tried Bear Country Bakery, we tried Ernie's, and then we also tried our favorite, which was the Book Peddler, which is actually a coffee shop and a bookstore put together. I absolutely loved this place. They have probably some of the hottest coffee I have ever had in my life. I love coffee super, super, super hot. And so this coffee was just perfect. They brew a local Montana coffee as well. So that was really cool to be able to kind of experience coffee on a local level. And then also they have a bookstore. And good books about uh, good books. Uh, about the park and, and Wyoming and Montana and stuff. And life and, in the West in general. I mean, just so yeah. great. And so that was a place that we went back to several times over Now, of course, you know we have to give you a pizza recommendation because it can't be the Epperson somewhere without pizza. And so we would absolutely recommend takeout from Wild West Pizza Saloon. Prices were really decent for the area, and the pizza was actually really, really good. Everybody devoured it. They've also got local beers on tap. So if you want to try something like Big Sky, you absolutely can while you're there. Uh, We are going to suggest one restaurant that you avoid before we move out of the food section. We did have our very last meal, wah, wah, at this place called Outpost Restaurant. And it was awful. It was just from the minute we walked in to the minute we left, we just couldn't get out of there fast enough. 
wicked expensive. They were charging $8 to add on a side of onion rings. I mean, just crazy. And, you know, and not most of the restaurants, you know, you hear about these gateway communities and them being expensive. Most restaurants in West Yellowstone, not too bad. No, not too bad at all. Absolutely comparable to what I expected. Some actually were cheaper than I thought. This place was overpriced. The food was awful. The people in it just seemed very, very unhappy to be there. <laughs> the, and, the, the people that worked there and the customers. <laughs> yeah, it was just not a good experience. And, you know, maybe we caught them on an off day. I don't know. But when you're going to go in and spend that kind of money, I mean, it would be nice if at least the food was hot. And we just at that point were like, we just want to get out of here. So there are so many restaurants there that it just don't go to the outpost. It's just not worth your time. So West Yellowstone is is a great place uh, t- to be your launching pad for an experience in Yellowstone National Park. There's everything that you need there. There's you know fishing gear and bait and tackle shops and all that. Absolutely. We were able to get packages. There's a a, a great store called uh, <laughs> called Quick we Print. We got packages. We did not have them sent to the campground. Uh, there is a store called Quick Print, which is like a shipping store that allows you to have packages sent to them and they charge you like two bucks for a a package so that's an overview of yellowstone national park and the town of west yellowstone next week when we come back we're going to talk about probably the southern half of the park yeah we're gonna have to break it down we're gonna have to break it up into halves i I think we could we could do this for five more weeks oh my goodness we could have stayed there for five more weeks there's just so much to do okay we're gonna be back in just a moment with our fresh tank black tank segment When it comes to RV travel, weather safety is a top priority, which is why the Highway Weather app provides weather forecasts for road trips along every point of your route adjusted to your time of travel. You can compare forecasts, get recommendations for the best time to head out, get severe weather alerts, add rest stops to long trips, and more. Did I mention all of that's included free in the app? For subscribers, there's a hands-free background feature to automatically alert you to upcoming bad weather. To download the app, visit highwayweather.io today or look for it in your iOS or Android app store. It's time to check the level of our tanks in our Fresh Tank Black Tank segment where we talk about the good and the bad happening in our week, in the world, whatever. (laughs) Abby, what is in your Black Tank this week? So my black tank has to do with another campground story, and it's not ours. <laughs> so, but it is all, it's as infuriating. So uh, there are some full-time travelers. They're called the Grateful Glamper, and they are, well, they're not really full-time. They're, they're not full-time, and that plays into this story. Yeah. They're, they're YouTubers, um, yeah. and, uh, and they're on social media and stuff like Yeah, this. I hate to define people as just YouTubers. They're, yeah, yeah I, yes. They, they, they document it, their travels across <laughs> social media. They actually lived in Colorado mm-hmm. and would uh, travel for the summer and then come back for the winter and their kids would go to school and all that sort of stuff. And they realized that maybe they were doing that wrong. And because they, you know, they're coming back they to a yeah, cold like... <laughs> state for the winter. So they thought right. maybe we're going to move and they put their house up for sale mm-hmm. and they moved to Florida and that way they could, you know, have the kids in school in Florida in the winter and be able to travel the rest of the country and go back to those cold states during the summer. Yeah. So they have relocated to Florida and they were staying at a campground. They wanted to do a monthly at this campground while they were getting settled. And the campground manager or campground owner. I what was the manager? Uh, yeah. a, a, a again, staff. once again, a manager just, you know. <laughs> there is a staff member thing. came to them, but, it, you know, enforcing owner's policies. And the policy was that they would not give them a monthly rental because they have children and they travel full time. I'm putting that in air quotes with their children. And this is an unacceptable lifestyle for children. Yeah. The, the, apparently the ownership, you know, p- pretty much admits to the fact that they just are against people traveling full time with their children. Yeah. So, you know, and they they had actually bought a house in Florida. Mm-hmm. They were only at this campground for like a week and they bought a house in Florida and they needed a little bit of time to close on it, so they just wanted the one month. They just wanted to extend their right. week into a month. They and they yeah. wouldn't do that for them because these kids for this one month are living full time in an RV. It's 
It's crazy. insane. They did a video about it, and we're going to drop it in the show notes. So if you want to go over and watch it and get the full story yourself. But I, this is speaking to a narrative that I think a lot more people recently, or at least we're starting to hear recently from a lot more people about the issues that they're having at private campgrounds where they just decide to make up these insane rules. Well, I think especially as campgrounds get busier and bus- busier, if mm-hmm. they don't have a need for for business, if they don't have a need to provide good customer service, then they stop doing it. And maybe I'm understanding the law wrong, but I'm pretty sure that this is illegal. I'm pretty sure it's illegal to discriminate because they are a family and not offer the site to them if it is available. It, it's a it, it gets into fair housing laws. Right. If a resort, if a campground is providing monthly rates, generally that's considered providing housing right Right. so if if your campground has people that stay there for several months of time or maybe all year round they're in the same campground that's that campground is providing full-time housing and if they do not allow families in families are a protected class under the fair housing act so not allowing families in is illegal unless it's a 55 and over park, which have their own specific rules. And this is not. In general. Now, a campground that doesn't do monthly rates can do what they can deny service to whoever for whatever reason they want to, whether it's discriminatory or not. But when it comes to housing laws, there are special laws that, that govern that. Yeah. And this whole story to me is just absolutely infuriating. I, I can't imagine what it must feel like to be denied a place to live just because you have children. I mean, that takes a real special kind of someone to say, no, I'm sorry, you can't live here because you have kids. I, I don't I don't get that. I don't know if it's just the way I have our Google alerts set up or whatever, but since our our little incident <laughs> at the Montrose campground, uh, I, there's just been so many situations like this coming up where people have had these really bad experiences, either getting kicked out of a campground for something innocuous or, uh, you know, uh, not being allowed into one for for a really silly reason. The people at, over at uh, enjoythejourney.life, their YouTube channel, they have just gone through an absurd oh, time yeah. over the last several months dealing with this campground in Florida that is essentially an HOA, like all the individual sites are mm. owned, but they were renting one. Go check out their videos because it's it's wackadoodle. It, it is. really is. And I can't really put my finger on it, and I'm not going to be able to articulate it well. But I think that we are at a tipping point here with the way that private campgrounds have been allowed to operate for a very, very long time. And the way now that the modern camper is going to allow themselves to be treated. And not to mention the fact that there are more campers now out on the road. There are going to be more people camping. And I understand that, you know, supply and demand, I can do whatever I want because I'm in demand. That is only going to get you so far before your supply is no longer in demand. It's weird. A lot of times when we talk about this this sort of stuff and bad customer service and and, and people, you know, being denied service, we get a lot of, well, they're, you know, it's their business. They're allowed to do whatever they want. It's my money. I'm allowed to spend it how I'd like. Yeah. And if, if somebody has a bad experience, they're allowed to talk about it. Right. You know, that, they're, that business is allowed to offer a bad experience, but other people are allowed to, you know, voice their disdain over that bad experience. I mean, I do wish that this family never had to go through this bad experience. Yeah. I wish we didn't have to have this conversation. I wish it wasn't my black tank. But I absolutely also don't want to see another family go through this. I don't want to see another family show up at that campground and be treated nasty or just feel uncomfortable because it's clear that children are not welcome there. This is a KOA, by the way. And uh, oh, that's right. Yeah, that that oh man, that's unfortunate to me. And I think this is a this is a problem KOA is going to start facing Mm -hmm. because KOA is uh, it, it is essentially just an association of campgrounds. None of these campgrounds are owned by the same people. They're all individual owners. They're allowed to make up their own rules. They have very, very slim limitations that are put onto them by KOA, but mainly it's a, you know, it's a marketing association, right? They're, they get to have all that 
help from KOA in marketing their facility. They get to have the KOA name on it. And I, I feel like KOA, you know, it's not like going to McDonald's. McDonald's are all owned by different people. A yeah. lot of them are. But McDonald's has very strict regimented way right. that those businesses right. have to operate. And you're going to get the same experience generally going into McDonald's. Not, I'm not saying McDonald's is great by any means. No, they're not a business model we're advocating or anything. But that's how most franchises work, right? Mm -hmm. um, but KOA doesn't quite work that way. And I think KOA is going to need to start, you know, looking at how it it works with these different businesses. Same thing with Jellystone as well. All right. What's your fresh tank this week? So my fresh tank this week is going to go out to a book series that our entire family has absolutely been devouring. It's not super new. It's been out for a while, but it's called The Land of Stories, and it's by Chris Colfer. He has just written this phenomenal piece of fiction that our whole family is really devouring. If you love Harry Potter, but you're feeling a little icky about J.K. Rowling right now, then this is the series you want to go and dive into. We have been listening to it in the truck. We listened to it all through Yellowstone. That's what we did as we were driving around. What a perfect place to listen to it. Perfect. And I would say you don't even need to have kids in order to enjoy this. I mean, we Jason and I are laughing. It's written really, really, really well. And it's, I believe there are six, maybe seven books at this point. We're on book three. The whole premise is that it, it's sort of all the fairy tales that you grew up mm -hmm. knowing uh, are real and they take place in another dimension. Yeah. And uh, it's really yeah, smart. It's fantastic. All right, Jay, what is in your black tank this week? There, there are a lot of new updates to RVs that are being announced right now. This is sort of the time of year that that often happens. New floor plans, um, just new refreshes of models and new models. And what I'm noticing a lot happening this year is there are many RVs that are now going to be shipping with solar pre-installed. Awesome, right? Mm -hmm. The problem is almost every single one of them is a single 100 watt solar panel. Wow. You know how much a 100 watt solar panel costs? It's about 90 bucks. What? There is that's all they're putting on there. That's all they're putting on there. It is, it, and this has been. Uh, this that is, isn't even going to power my coffee pot. This is something I'm really noticing a lot lately, and I think I talked about this a little bit a couple weeks ago. Um, there are very inexpensive things that manufacturers are starting to throw on RVs just to entice you. Mm -hmm. And if you're somebody who thinks I want an RV with solar, who wouldn't? I'm going to buy this one because it has solar on it. That 100 watt panel is going to do nothing for you. It's going to do, I mean, it, it may keep your LED lights running, but if you want to, that, will, that won't even refresh your battery no. to run the fan in your bathroom overnight. 100 watts is Ugh. not much at all. And there's no reason they couldn't put, you know, two 200 watt panels, quadruple it for, a, for you know, $300 total it's just to be able to use a buzzword a it, selling a selling word it's like the outdoor shower you they're, know they're doing this with wi-fi antennas they're doing this with backup camera pre-wiring solar pre-wiring uh, just lots of little you just have to be careful because there are lots of these little tiny things that don't cost them much money at all what is great is if you're buying an rv with that 100 watts of solar you know maybe it comes with a 2000 watt inverter and it comes with the solar charger and those are the things that you need to expand on your solar system and you could go then expand on your solar system but 100 watt panels in general are you know they're sort of not something that people look at buying anymore because it's taking up a large amount of space for a low wattage when you can get a 200 watt a 300 watt panel that are not much bigger you know so it's taking up the same amount of roof space why get a 100 watt panel when yeah. you can get more you know sometimes people will buy 400 watt panels well why do that when you can buy you know, two 200 watt panels and take half as much roof space up. So it uh, it would be really disappointing to me to buy an RV and it only had one 100 watt <laughs> roof panel on it. It'll keep Especially your battery. Especially when you go to use it. <laughs> the, the one nice thing about that is that if you do store your RV outside while you're not using it, it will keep your battery topped off mm -hmm. for that that kind of period. 
uh, but it's not going to help you get through a, a boondocking session. No, not at all. All right. What is in your fresh tank this week? Uh, my fresh tank is a new belt I found, and I actually <laughs> found it at that gift shop at that campground that we stayed at in West Yellowstone. Yellowstone Trading Post. Yeah. Yellowstone Trading Post. Uh, this is a belt by a company called Arcade, and I, uh, you know, <laughs> I I'm a I'm a little bit bigger guy. I have no waist whatsoever, so I have a hard time keeping my pants up. All right. Oh yeah. I mean, to the point where I'm like <laughs> oh, considering <yeah. laughs> suspenders. No. Okay. No, we're not gonna we're not considering <laughs> suspenders. We're considering other things we need to do so we don't have to get suspenders. <laughs> and when and regular belts like with the holes in the buckle, like I have to tighten them several times throughout the day. Um, and I like the sort of strappy belts, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but they never hold my pants up ever. <laughs> so uh, these belts by Arcade are super lightweight. They're very elastic. So it is almost like adding the. It's almost like adding an elastic waistband to your pants if you you know if you have wearing jeans and, hey, you're essentially um, turning them back into toddler wear <laughs> exactly because all toddler exactly. jeans are elastic banded and what's so great is there there's no metal in them so they're tsa friendly mm -hmm. and they uh you can actually leave them in your pants and throw them in the washer if you want to and and oh. not have to take them out well that has <laughs> happened many times to a belt that was not washer friendly but you know, uh, you know in my entire life this is the first time i've been able to wear a belt and say like it is actually 100 working, <laughs> working yeah. and comfortable yeah. does not hurt all because a lot of the belts i wear that you know especially in a long driving day that belt buckle will dig into my belly and that i mean <laughs> i mean i know it's silly but it no it hurts it's hurts a lot no, look you and i both are victims of uh having children <laughs> and you are a victim of yeah it was rough on me yeah you, know. you are a victim of having a wife when she was pregnant who only wanted like chicken fingers french fries dipped in honey mustard dressing you know you're we are victims of those cravings that i was unable to deny the first time the second time and the third time so as long as for the majority of the time we have been together you have never had a belt that works for you and it was just like the most <laughs> just the most what is like such a special day for you when you well, put this belt and on and you were like oh my god it works and they're awesome and outdoorsy and, yeah. and great for sort of an adventure uh type travel which is great and it's a great price point too i think it was about 30 dollars yeah. for the belt at, at, in west yellowstone at a gift shop hey there you go we'll link to it in the show notes though too if you want to go check out this belt that is making sure jason doesn't have to buy suspenders all right, let's wrap this episode up with a brain teaser. I am an odd number. Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. I am an odd number. Take away one letter and I become even. What number am I? Well, I, I have the answer to that in all. What, you want to answer? <laughs> no, I wanted to say I selected this one. Oh, you did. You did. I did. We'll have the answer to that and a whole lot more on next week's episode of the RV Miles podcast. Yes, we will. And hey, we just want to remind you again, if you are enjoying RV Miles, please head over to Apple Podcast and leave us a five-star review. Thank you to everyone who has done that already. It's so great to hear from all of you. And it really is putting RV Miles in front of a whole new audience. Also, we want to remind you that RV Miles is all across social media. And we really want to encourage you to come join the RV Miles Facebook group. It's a nice, intimate group of people who are really, really kind and really do like to help one another out. So please come and join us if you haven't already. Until next week, thank you so much for joining us. Jason and I are so glad you are here and keep logging those RV miles. Bye, everybody.